Let's wait for it to go live. Okay. We are live. All right. So uh, welcome to building predictability into your pipeline. Um, my name is Pete Garson. I'm developer advocate at Active State. I'm super excited about today's discussion. Uh, we're covering some of the pains developers experience on a daily basis around reproducible builds, environment configuration, dependency management. And uh, we're talking about this because this is like a pain that developers experience every day and we want to help solve it. So uh, Active State's been working in open source languages for quite a long time. We're pretty passionate about open source and we really want to help make things go faster and easier in your organization. Uh, so one of the things we've discovered was dependency management and reproducibility are among the prime roadblocks to organizations adopting Go. Uh, and we want to help clear those roadblocks. And we believe conversations like today, uh, bringing different brains around the table here to discuss is a good way to start. So uh, let's get started uh, with uh, our panel here today. So uh, let me introduce everybody. So we have uh, Jess Frizzell from Microsoft, who works at Microsoft on open source containers and Linux. She has been maintainer of Docker, contributor to Run C, Kubernetes, and Golang, as well as any many other projects. We have Russ Cox, Go lead at Google. And Russ is the tech lead at the Go team at Google. He created the Go command, including Go get, and is responsible for most of what you love and hate about it. And of course, we also have Sam Boyer from Stripe. Uh, Sam cares deeply about building healthy communities, always looking for ways to bring technology's enormous potential to bear on the world's critical problems. By day, he's a software engineer at Stripe, but you likely also know him as one of the principal maintainers of the DEP project. So welcome to all three of you, and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, just really quickly about the format. Uh, we'll spend about 45 minutes talking, discussing amongst ourselves here. Then we'll have about 15 min minutes to answer audience questions. So you can submit your questions in the comment box on YouTube, or you can tweet at us. So tweet at Active State with the hashtag GoFaster. Uh, make sure you watch to the end. We'll ask for your help what we can do next in the next session. And uh, this session will be recorded on our channel for on-demand viewing. All right, so uh, we'll get started here. So, you know, not much happening this week in Go land, you know, just a, just a normal all week. Uh, so why don't we start, though, uh, just to give some context for the people watching to go back to sort of the root of the problem around dependency management. And uh, you guys had all sort of at, at different times sat on the committee that that uh, was trying to come up with solutions for this problem and just give us sort of a maybe frame a little bit of the history for us. So I don't, I don't know, maybe Russ, if you want to start. Oh, Russ, we can't hear you. Uh -oh. Sorry. Okay. We, we choose Go install about 2010, which was about um, eight years ago. And so like the problem actually starts sort of long before the committee. Um, right. And so, you know, Go install was this experiment to go download code from people's repos and try to share that way. And, you know, before that, people were actually just sending each other zip files or doing checkouts into random places. And there, there wasn't even a convention around, you know, pads beginning with github.com slash foo for GitHub repos. Um, it was all just different. And if you basically, if you tried to download a package from someone that was more than one directory uh, that actually had an import in it, that import probably didn't work, right? Um, that, that was sort of the state of the world. And so Go install, uh, which became Go get, sort of added this, this idea of the sort of uh, code hosting site import paths. And that helped a lot. That, that you know, helped sort of bring all this sort of work together in a way that you could use it. But the thing that was missing, and if you go back and like click on the, the original thread that, that introduced Go install. Like there's lots of discussion there about like, we need something to do with versioning. And you know, we said, great, yeah, we do. We don't know what, let's figure this part out first and, and we'll come back to it, right? And um, you know, I think we took too long to come back to it, but uh, we have. And um, one thing that happened along the way was vendor directories. And so this idea I think came over from Node and some other man package managers where you know, you're just gonna copy all your dependencies into the tree and we had been proposing this for a while, but we had been saying, well, when you do that, you rewrite the import paths to reflect the new location. And the big thing about vendor directories, which we added for real in, in Go 1.5, was that you didn't have to rewrite the imports anymore. You could just copy the real source files and diff them later and things like that. And a bunch of tools got written that built up around vendor directories. And then in GopherCon in 2016, which I was not actually at, uh, I was on paternity leave, but um, there was a, a discussion in the, the Go 
I guess they called it the, the, the Go team room on hack day about dependency management. And that was really the start of um, you know, the rest of the story. And I'll, I'll let Sam take it from there. Okay. Sam, do you want to pick it up from there? Yeah, sure. Um, I was also not at that GopherCon. I was, I was sitting in Slack having things like <laughs> telegraphed to me by someone who actually was in the room. Um, but uh, so I feel like, I think it went, so we, we came back from, came back from that GopherCon. Uh, and at that point, um, uh, Andrew Drand was saying he's, you know, be, will be the person from the Go team to, uh, uh, to, to, to actively keep an eye on this. Um, uh, and right after then, Peter Bergon um, uh, said, you know what, I don't really care what we get. I just want to see this happen. So I will sort of use my position in the community to convene a group of people uh, who will, will, you know, try to put together a, uh, a plan and a prototype. Um, and that group then became uh, Jesse. Uh, Peter's the facilitator, uh, Ed Muller. Um, uh, me and what, who am I? And Andrew, right, yes. Um, uh, so we started meeting in October, 2016. Uh, we were meeting twice a week. You know, we went through a whole ton of like design documents and then eventually ended up um, January of last year uh, publishing the prototype that became Step. Um, and it's, it's kind of been a roller coaster ride since then. Uh, but, you know, I, I gave a, uh, I gave the, the closing keynote at GopherCon last year to say, um, uh, we're ready, you know, <laughs> hop on. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot since then. Uh, Jesse, do you have any bits you want to add to that? Um, not really. That really summed it up. I mean, it's amazing that like the community was uh, kind of allowed to execute in this manner and that we got it done when it was kind of like a side project for all of us, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah, it, it definitely, so, you know, when you, last year you, you kind of, you announced that, that it was, you know, people use, use this, use DEP in your projects, uh, you know, what you start, start using it in production if you, if you can, you know, what was the sort of uptake on, on DEP and that, you know, people, did people start tagging versions? Did they, did they start using it in production? Like, you know, how did, right. what did you guys see in, in the usage there? So um, uh, this is actually a little tricky to uh, to find numbers on for interesting reasons. Turns out um, GitHub's BigQuery data set, or BigQuery's GitHub data set, excuse me, uh, has not been updated since November. And being that like literally half of Depp's public use me in production lifetime is that span of time, uh, it didn't actually have that useful, uh, that much useful data in it. Um, and I was, maybe somebody else is, is better at this than me, um, but uh, uh, I could not figure out how to actually search enough history to get a precise answer as to the, well, what I really wanted was the number of active repositories, um, uh, like since that time in July, right, that are, that are using one tool or another. However, what I was able to put together, which is interesting, um, is uh, a rough look at the number of like active projects that are actually using it. So looking at the, uh, 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 the search results that I can get, I can tell you that there's like an average or so of 110 projects. Um, uh, we have 110 different projects, you know, pushing per day, um, or rather, you know, a thousand projects over the last nine days, just spring projects over the last nine days use depth, um, a thousand projects over the last 35 days use glide, uh, about 820 over the last 34 days use go vendor. And then like 980 over the last 120 days use GoDep. But that's like 110 projects a day for DEP, 28 for Glide, 24 for GoVendor, and 8 for, for GoDep. So actually actively updated projects. So um, as far as I'm able to put together, I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty considerable uptake. On the version tagging front, though, that has been, uh, I don't have numbers on that. Um, it has been less. Uh, I feel pretty responsible for that. Um, I, for whatever reason, put... I mentally categorized uh, putting out good documentation on it behind having a tool that facilitated telling people what the next semantic version should be. We still sort of have people like working on that in the background, but um, uh, so we have not had really good, strong, clear docs. Like Dave Cheney wrote, wrote something, has written a bunch of good things about this, you know, over the years, but we just, we didn't have that as sort of part of what we published. So I would say that certainly some people did, but for the most part, people who were already doing, December tagging, continue doing it, and I have not necessarily seen a ton more. 
but yeah. Okay. And what, Jess, what, what was something that you, you wanted to see come out of this process, this experiment with DEP? Like what, you know, as somebody on the committee to say, like, you know, what was important to you to see come out of this? Um, I guess like something with a good user interface that would allow people like at least like 99% of the Go users to solve their problems with it. And then, um, yeah, just being able to also use it for a large project, which has different problems when it comes to dependencies. So uh, those were kind of like the two main things I focused on. Right. And so uh, have have you guys seen uh, any large projects, you know what I mean, like particularly large ones adopting uh, depth usage right now? So, uh, I mean, the, the like go-to one, Kubernetes, right? Um, yeah. The thing blocking Kubernetes from using depth is actually, uh, the primary thing is, is the internal staging directory that they use. Um, so, uh, although just in the past couple weeks, I don't know where they are exactly, uh, but I was, I was working with a um, contributor when I was at Fostem. Uh, and when you put that in place, the build pipeline is already five times faster than it was with Goda. And it doesn't have any problem, you know, once he figured out this little, he, he literally like he, he sets up, this is uh, uh, Stefan Schmansky, he, um, he sets up a Git server in the background that like serves those subdirectories out from a magic place. It's hilarious that he makes it work, but he makes it work. And once he figured out how to make it work, um, yes, like it, it's tremendously faster. It does not have a problem handling that environment. Yeah, and that's not a depth problem. That is a Kubernetes problem, right, and that they right. are using symlinks for these directories, which I don't even know the reason behind that, but I'm sure there is, was one at one yeah. point in time. <laughs> it's bad. Cool. So depth is being used. So you've got some big projects using it. Yep. And then this week, enter Vigo here. So uh, Russ, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, what Vigo is and how it's similar, but maybe how it's also different from DEP and, you know, kind of maybe talk a little bit through why you've, it, you know what I mean, why you took this route and, sure. and yeah, give a little bit of background for folks. Yeah. So, um, you know, when DEP came out uh, in, you know, January of last year, a team at Google approached me and said, well, you know, we, we wrote this OAuth 2 package or we're maintaining it now. And, um, you know, we have some backwards and compatible changes we want to make. And, you know, how do we do that? Can we start, you know, can we tag 2.0 and sort of move on? And I started thinking through some of the implications of that. And I found that, in fact, that was going to break a lot of things. Um, you know, first of all, it would break people who are still using GoGet. But, but even people who are using uh, DEP or, or any of the other tools that, that preceded DEP, uh, you can get into these states where, uh, you know, you're using two different packages. They both use OAuth, but they want different major versions. And now you have a, a real problem. Um, and so I, I laid that out in the blog post that I, I put out yesterday that I called semantic import versioning, um, you know, laying out like exactly the scenario that I worked through with them. And, and that really convinced me that we need to be a little more uh, cautious about incompatibility. And, and in particular, it led to this idea of putting the major version in the import path, which is something that, you know, we've discussed for a very long time. Obviously, uh, Gustavo Niemeyer's uh, gopackage.insight does that. Um, and it has for forever. Um, you know, I think he brought that up around in 2012 or something like that. But um, but you know there were debates in the community about well should we have versions in import paths or not? And we didn't have an answer. Like there was it was just sort of a matter of taste or it seemed like one. And and what that thought experiment really taught me was yeah there's actually a good reason to do that. Like I can I can give you the argument why right. And that's what that blog post yesterday was. Um, and so once I started thinking about that, then it it. You know, once you decide that we're not going to make breaking changes without changing the import path, then a lot of other things get a lot easier. Like, you know, you can expect that the newest version of a given import path must work as a drop in replacement for an earlier one, you know, modulo bugs that you want to avoid and things like that. But it's never the case that it's the, the expected state for, for long term is that this import path has changed its meaning and you just you have to deal with that. Um, and so, you know, you have to deal with temporary breakages, but not that sort of long term one. And so what came out of that was this. Uh, other thing I posted yesterday called minimal version selection, which is sort of a different way to decide what goes into a build. Um, <clears throat> and all of that, you know, I, I actually presented the, the uh, versions import paths to the package management committee last November. And, and in general, uh, the reaction was, was not terribly positive. Um, <laughs> uh, I think for the most part, people believe that, you know, they still shouldn't be there. And, um, 
and you know didn't find the example terribly compelling. And at the time, it, it actually wasn't that compelling. Um, and in fact, six months earlier at GopherCon, I had I had present or just before GopherCon, I, I had shown them some other ideas that I had to figure out how to solve the OAuth problem that were much more complex. They're much more like the sort of hypothetical souped-up package manager in the story. And I had worked out how to implement all of these, and I actually had like toy examples working in the Go command. Uh, and it was very clear to me that like I was going to end up building a system that like no one could understand, and when it broke, it was just going to be impossible to, to deal with. Um, and so, you know, after that experience with the ridiculously complex thing, and then the version numbers and import paths, um, you know, I decided, okay, well, you know, what we should really do is is you know see how this is going to work for real, like build something, a little trial, and and see what it looks like. And so that process from you know late November till now ended up being what, what turned into Vigo. And so Vigo is sort of the next prototype of what the actual Go command integration should look like. And you know, it, it can make different decisions than DEP because it's integrated with the Go command. So you know, it doesn't have to express everything in terms of vendor directories, for example. Um, and there's also some other cleanup that we'd like to do at the same time. Uh, you know, the Go command right now, because it the sort of experimental Go install history, it, it just uses version control tools directly. And that's great for a lot of things, but it also causes many problems, like all the version control tools are inside your security perimeter, for example. And I'd rather they not be. We've had repeated problems because of that. Um, it also it also fragments the community. So you know, if you don't have Bazaar installed, which many people don't, for a long time you couldn't use packages from Launchpad.net because Canonical was using Bazaar. And and I'd really like to just move them out. And so there's a lot of other sort of cleanup that if you're going to do this change, you, you can you can add at the same time. And so all of that came together as this prototype um, that I, I you know posted the first post about last week, and I'm still finishing the editing of, of posts about there be um, at least one more today, uh, two more in the next couple of days. Um, and then next week, we'll, we'll kick off, you know, an actual like proposal process of, you know, gathering feedback. And the, the goal is to have something along these lines, you know, filtered through the community feedback available for, you know, trial use as part of the tool chain in the next Go release. So that, um, you know, if you have a repository that has one of these the files that we currently call go.mod that is, you know, describes your dependencies and things like that, uh, you know, it'll just work in that mode. And if you don't, it'll work in the old mode. And so you can sort of it's go back and forth and experiment. And and one of my favorite features about the the new stuff is that it was kind of forced to do this, but it's a good thing anyway. You don't have to work in GoPath anymore. So we've had, you know, no end of problems uh, getting new users set up with GoPath. It's very foreign. Uh, it's difficult to set environment variables persistently on Windows. Um, there's like a host of problems that GoPath causes. It mixes all your code together. And so being able to work outside GoPath is actually one of my favorite things about this, you know, separate from all the versioning. <laughs> yeah. I think I think a lot of people probably are like happy that GoPath is going away. I don't know what what uh, Jess and Sam think, but I think it's probably pretty Kill it. universal. Kill it with fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually, I, I have. Uh, I think that there is an interesting use case for um, for GoPath as a as a functional workspace. Uh, one of the the things that was brought up a lot in the depth development cycle was the the, the multi project workflow, you know, that we call it. Um, and uh, I have a, a thing that I wrote a year ago or so about it, but uh, instead of having to like explicitly say, you know, I want to use um, uh, such and such dependency from my, uh, my GoPath, um, uh, once you get all of the stuff that you're not actually working on out of the GoPath that we're accustomed to today, you move it into this, this source cache space that, you know, now exists with Vigo. Now you have this like cool clarity of intent thing where the only stuff that's actually in this workspace are things you're actively hacking on. Um, and it's, uh, it, it is one of the, the, um, because that completely went in this other direction, like the project centric workflow, it's one of the definite pain points that people have with it. Um, and I, for reasons, have never added the, the, uh, support for it. Um, so yeah. Um, but apart from that, you know, like kill go path with fire, the, the default should not be to require go path. So this is great. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's probably, uh, you know, pretty universal. What about, uh, the other the other sort of thing that maybe we should talk a little bit about is the sort of minimal version selection algorithm that you're introducing, which I think that, you know, from some people's perspective, you know, if you're, for instance, like a large enterprise and you have like, you know, systems that you can't like, you are actively trying not to update them as much as you humanly possible. 
that this makes a lot of sense, but you know, what's your, you know, I know that this is in your post, you said that this is sort of counter to what the default algorithm is elsewhere. So maybe everyone can sort of chat about what, what they think about the, the MVS algorithm. Who wants to start? I'll let the others talk first. Okay. <laughs> Jess, do you want to start? What do you think? Um, I mean, I think it's pretty smart from, in terms of the fact that like no one seems to know how to version correctly and actually not make breaking changes. And a lot of those changes sometimes are people using, um, you know, things that aren't actually features as features. Um, so I think that this will prevent a lot of that kind of pain in the development cycle. So I, I'm a fan. <laughs> Sam? Uh, we could spend multiple hours talking about this. Um, uh, I will, uh, I, I think it is um, too much of a reduction. Uh, and I think it will end up being, end up causing more hurt than it helps. Um, uh, there's a lot of things to, to be commended about it. And, you know, like when you compare to depth, there are expressiveness reductions that need to happen in the model that depth has. But uh, yeah, I, I think it will, I'm, I'm at the least concerned. There's gonna be a lot more that I'm, I'm gonna be writing about this soon. So like I said, we could talk about it for, far too long. Russ and I already have. <laughs> yeah, we, we've spent many, many hours on it already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that's the big, that's the big question, right? Is it too simple? Right. And, and we don't know yet. Um, you know, we're going to find out. And if it's, if it is too simple, then, you know, we'll, we'll adjust. But, um, but I, I wanted to respond to the, the thing about not getting updates automatically, because I think that, I think that's been one of the sticking points for a lot of people. They hear, oh, you, you, you know, use the oldest version that works, right? And you're like, never get new code. Yeah, it's, not and it's not so much that you never get new code. It's that you only get new code when you explicitly ask for that new code, right? So if you say update, uh, you know, my dependency foo to, you know, latest, which is the default, um, when you say update foo, you get the newest foo, but then you still get for its dependencies, you know, the ones that it was building with. Not the, like the one that came out last night that the author of Foo has never actually tried before and maybe doesn't work, right? And so uh, there's a sort of limitation on the update that you know you get the newest version of the thing you asked for, and then you get the ones that they were using, or maybe if some other part of your build needed a newer one, you get the ones that someone else in your build was using, but you never get one that no one has used before that just came out. And I think that's the, sort of the key difference, right? It's like it's not taking the newest ones, but it's also not taking like ancient ones. It's just taking ones that are just a little bit older. Um, in the in the sort of expectation of practice that, that I have. And so I think that that really gives you control. You don't do thing until you ask for the new thing. And, you, and when you do ask for a new thing, you're, you're in the right sort of mental state of mind to say, you know, oh, I have to check if it still works. You know, something might be broken and so on, right? And, and furthermore, because you only update the thing you asked for, which is usually your direct dependency, you're in sort of a good state. If your code breaks, you understand, oh, something must have changed about this particular thing, and I understand what I'm depending on from that thing. Whereas mm -hmm. when you do an update in, in you know, another system updates all the dependencies transitively, right? Something can break five levels down that because of something six levels down, and now somehow it's your fault, right? And it's your problem to debug. And, and that's the sort of situation that, that I would like to avoid with this. Yeah, I also like it because I remember like in our initial committee discussions. I was always the person who was like, I want to pin on a SHA. I want to pin on a SHA. Mostly because for Docker, we had a bash script where we pinned on the SHAs. So, and that was our vendor script. Like that's how we did vendoring. So I think like for, you know, like little toy projects or like personal projects, it's nice to have that automatic upgrade. But when you are actually like shipping something, you don't want anything to update unless you explicitly tell it. And to be clear, you can upgrade everything. You just say, go get minus u and upgrades everything. It's just like, you have to ask it to do that. And if you want that, great, ask it. Cool. Yeah, well, the, I think the I, only, go I, ahead. I was going to say, the, the only clarifying bit there is to say that, uh, uh, the, the only thing I would add there is to say that the, um, uh, actually, I, I like that property. I agree with Russ that the, the idea that, you know, we should probably at least start, at least start um, by defaulting to the set of dependencies uh, that our dependencies were built with, those are much more likely to work because software is terrible and always breaks. So, you know, maybe start with that set, like that's our best guess. Um, uh, the, uh, I articulated a similar idea around this a couple years ago that I referred to as preferred versions. It's not a necessary property, or it's, sorry, it's, uh, this property is not one that is necessarily exclusive of uh, an MBS algorithm. Uh, it is one that certainly can be 
um, at least approximated. It would not work exactly the same way, but in a in a in a more complex system. Right. Noting. That's all. The other the other property that this has, I'm I, I'm sorry, we can move on to another thing, but no, I, no, I think no, this no. Is it's an interesting it's, point because there's a sort of like policy, sort of social policy question here. And one of the things that, that is unique, as far as I understand, about the particular algorithm that we're doing is that, uh, you know, the only constraints that your dependencies get to impose on your own build is to upgrade packages. They can say, I need a newer version, and then that, that constraint wins, right? Because you take the, the um, oldest version that satisfies all the constraints, which ends up being the max of the constraints. Um, and so, you know, the only thing a dependency can do to me is make me use something newer. As opposed to right now, in, in most of these other systems, you know, dependencies can impose essentially arbitrary constraints. So, you know, there's an open bug right now in the Kubernetes Go client that it happens to be pinning to a SHA, probably because there were no releases, of this YAML package. And it's pinning to a SHA that is actually two years old today, um, or, you know, right now, not exactly today. But um, the result of this is that if you try to use, if you're using, you know, some new version of the YAML package and you've just written down, like, I need the V2 branch, and you're using some new feature in it, and then you add the Kubernetes Go client to your, your build, it actually, most of these package managers will downgrade it so that it matches the shot that Kubernetes wants, because that's still on the two branch, so we're happy in theory. But the new feature that you were using isn't there, and you go run your build, and the compiler says, I don't know what that function is. And, and it's very confusing. That's what this, this bug report you know, went through. And so taking away the ability of your dependencies to hold back your upgrades, I think is just as important. Interesting. That's a, that's definitely really interesting. So do, do you guys think like, um, would you, would you think like in terms of growing adoption of go, you know, one of the problems that people have always said is like, oh, but I don't want to, you know, go get always just pulls the bleeding edge kind of thing. Right. And so changing that default behavior, do you, you know what I mean? Is that like sort of a conscious effort to like, okay, th this is addressing those problems that we're hearing out there and, hopefully growing the adoption for like large projects or, you know, like enterprise projects kind of thing. Where I think this whole effort, this whole multi-year effort is, is to address exactly that broader problem. Yeah. Certainly the specific issue of go get minus U is broken and so is go get. So there's like no working go get command um, in, in terms of versioning, right? That particular problem led me down this, this path that got me to minimal version selection. But the bigger picture is that like all of this work is exactly to address the fact that you know lots of people are waiting to adopt go until it has package management and package versioning and you, you know you can do things like express reproducible builds and say i built at this version right like if you can't say what version you built at that's really a non-starter for a huge number of people and it should be mm -hmm. yep. yeah it's i i think it's worth noting that that like while there are definitely outstanding disagreements here we're we're like we're disagreeing in a sort of a small corner of a universe there is <laughs> there is a lot of good which is coming um and there's there's no question about that it is going to look the the go ecosystem is going to look very different in a very positive way um in in <laughs> relatively short order so we're close great and so uh, yeah so speaking of timeline like what what's the sort of you outlined this a little bit in your post but maybe just talk about here like what's the sort of timeline to integrate this with the go command kind of thing and your proposal to integrate it as part of the official distro. Right. So, I mean, the important thing now is to gather feedback from the community, right? Like, we don't want to rush anything. Um, we want to make sure we get it right. And so, you know, I, I don't know how many people remember aliases, but, um, you know, <laughs> aliases were, were, happened that same summer, actually. Uh, they were presented at the GopherCon that I didn't attend. And, um, and I came back from the leave, and there was, you know, this very long comment thread, and I read through it very carefully. And, you know, I post this thing, it's like, okay, well, you know, it seems like conversation has died out. Um, you know, I see the points, but, you know, I think they've been addressed by the other comments. Let's do this. And that was not actually the right response, <laughs> it turned out. Um, uh, because, you know, people had not been heard or they didn't feel like they had been heard, right? And like, even though I actually did read, like I printed out this enormous printout and went and sat outside for like two hours, um, but, you know, it wasn't a discussion, right? It was just like all this feedback came in and you couldn't tell that it had been, had been validated. And so when we when we did, so we actually pulled aliases out of that release um, very shortly before it, uh, before it went out, went out. And we tried again, you know, in the next round. And so we'll do that again if this, if we need to, right? Like if this isn't right, we won't put it in, we'll do it over, we'll get it right. But 
one thing I learned from the alias uh, troubles was that it's very important to have sort of a back and forth engagement and have like some sort of summary of the discussion so far. And so the the official go proposal is probably going to start uh, next you know next week or maybe the week after, and and there'll be like active sort of management and curation of that discussion so that. Uh, you know, we can actually have a real discussion with the community and, and you know, have a record of that. Uh, and then the goal is to have this all in Go 111, which the development cycle for Go 111 just opened. It's February, March, April, uh, April 30 if it closes. And then uh, May, June, July, we work on, you know, getting the release ready. And then August 1st is the release, unless we slip like we always do. Um, but, you know, so August 1st, in theory, like, we want to have this for people to try. And and maybe there will still be changes at that point, you know, in the in, you know after that. But then the following release, which should be about February first of next year, uh, we'd really like to have this locked in. And again, that schedule may slip because it's not ready yet, and, and we'll let that happen if it if it needs to. But my goal is that you know a year from now things are very different, and these companies that are holding back don't have to hold back anymore. Cool. Well, I think I think everybody's going to be pretty pretty excited and looking forward to that and engaging with the process, I think, along the way, because there's a lot to be, I think people have been waiting, you know what I mean? And any step forward closer, do you know what I mean? Like we've had steps already with depth there, but, you know, any step a little bit closer is is great. Um, maybe what we'll do here is we'll keep moving along here. And we sort of, you know, we spent some time there talking about Go and dependency management, but, uh, one of the main reasons that we obviously do reproducible builds is to deploy them and have them be deployed uh, in a consistent manner kind of thing. And so obviously we have now amazing things like Docker and Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff. But there's sort of, there's still organizations out there who are running like installers on physical machines and they sort of, they'll run the installer on the physical machine install their app and then it stays like that kind of forever kind of thing. Uh, you know, the app might get updated, but the environment might not. So, uh, you know, is what's the sort of, what would you guys sort of recommend to sort of kickstart the process maybe at your organization? And, you know, what are some of the big benefits of making the change to, maybe we should be using containers to deploy our applications to have a consistent environment or that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like how, what, what are the steps that we want to take to, you know, encourage the adoption of this and not having like manually configured machines out there kind of thing, because that's not reproducible at all. So uh, maybe Jess, do you want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, I know the container hype. Um, yeah. I mean, I think as far as like getting buy-in from the organization, like that takes a lot of effort because um, people are set in their ways when it comes to like the way that they work. Um, so a lot of like the tooling around containers and all that is mostly trying to get the good workflows for people so that they can use it. And a lot of that is like CI, CD. Um, and each organization, like at least that I've talked to, has their own kind of setups for CI, CD. And it's funny because there's all these startups that also do CI, CD. But I'm like, hey, you guys, are you talking to anyone? Because they're all different. Like every single CI, CD is its own unique snowflake. So. Uh, like the tooling behind containers makes it easy to actually integrate that into your unique snowflake, which is nice. Um, so I think it's just more, you know, working with those companies and stuff, which a lot of like the big companies that are getting like buy-in for cloud are doing. Um, so that's really cool. Um, but there all will always be like those servers that you treat like they're actual pets. Um, yeah. Because like <laughs> if you have a mainframe or something, at some level you are treating a server like it's a pet. So I'm not really sure what to do about that. Yeah. Is there any sort of like, you know, would you guys, anyone have any like uh, gotchas, you know, like, you know, this is probably not a magic bullet that if you just switch to containers, then everything will be solved kind of thing. Is there, any, <laughs> you know, you know, watch out for this kind of thing. I mean, it's not a magic bullet. Like no one is really claiming that maybe other people, but not people who actually work on this stuff. Um, <laughs> Like it's mostly just like a new set of abstractions that allow you to kind of do things a bit easier than in your in the past. So once you kind of buy into that scenario, then you see it. But it's at no point are we like we're gonna save the world with containers. <laughs> so okay, so what about um, so Go obviously is really well suited to containers because it's compiled and you can make like really really tiny containers. But um, one of the things we see is like. Um, 
with uh, interpreted languages like Python, say, uh, the, the runtime can be quite large, right? And uh, especially if you're doing sort of data science stuff, it can be really, really big. Uh, is there any sort of techniques or best practices or things to keep in mind about, you know, keeping those kind of environments or, and configuring those environments in a consistent way? Yeah, I mean, so even with the Windows containers, those can be like massive because the base image for Windows is like three gigs. Um, so there isn't much being done there, mostly because at this point in time, when people switch over to containers, what they're doing is putting the monolith into the container. So they're going to have it in a knit and they're going to treat it like a VM, basically. So like your concern is not size then. It's mostly like, let's get this thing to work in the container and then we can split it out. Um, so yeah, um, I think if we could just make the internet and passing turtles around faster, that would solve all the problems. But yeah, most people don't really try to make their images small now, but I feel like once containers become like a thing of the past that's kind of boring and like you just do it without thinking, there will be like a best practices push inside companies to like actually do it good. Right. Okay. So one of the things um, that, uh, that I'm, really excited to work on when I like free time in my life um, is, uh, uh, well, actually, and this, this ties into Vigo well, right? Like one of the things that, that Vigo does now is it embeds into the binary, this full picture of the information about what all the dependencies were that were being, you know, they're used to actually construct this binary, right? It's super cool to have this information. Um, there is this sort of opaque layer between the thing that the container is running and you know the container itself which means that there's a there's a whole lot of information that's lost uh from what you're trying to run versus you know the sort of the, the level of your infrastructure this kind of will get sort of replayed depending on on how you construct your container image but um uh one of the things in particular like so when i when i when i think about data science bits um if we're talking about being able to uh, to better separate and organize and not just make the tubes pass tarballs around faster, but, you know, like separate and, and organize um, uh, the bits of our containers and say, hey, you know, maybe we've got our data science components that are over here, whatever. Um, to the extent that we can make language package managers um, uh, that, you know, are a level perhaps at which you're saying, hey, I need like this data set because it has to be on my system locally when I'm testing, but then also be in production. To the extent that we can take the information that the language package manager is already good at handling, bake it into the information that goes into the container and the container can then use that and bubble that out on the other side to help figure out the way you constitute your container ecosystem. Now we are cooking with gas or some sort of expression <laughs> like that. But yeah, like to the extent that we can stop duplicating all of the knowledge that we already have down at, at like the working on the application level up at the system composition level, I, I think we there's something really powerful there. Cool. And you mentioned about the verification, like so the, the embedded stuff in, in the binary. So uh, Russ, you actually posted today, earlier today, uh, yesterday about the night last night about the verification step. Do you want to talk a little, just quickly about the verification step in Vigo? That's Sure. I mean, there, there's been all these things over the last year. I feel like I felt like a broken record. Like people talk to me about, well, we really need to do this. And I, you know, a lot of time the guy, look, I know I've said this before, but as soon as we understand versioning in the Go command, that will be easy. <laughs> and, and like, this is one of them, right? Because once you actually have a concept of like being able to say, I use this thing at this version, then it's easy to write that down and put that in the binary. And so, you know, there's a tool that you can pull it back out with. Um, <clears throat> and similarly, uh, you know, we have also directory ha hashes of the entire, you know, tree of files that went into that particular module at that version. And so we can pull those out too. And so, you know, even if you have a local modification, maybe, you know, that shows up in the hash. Um, <clears throat> but, but maybe even more importantly, uh, if, if you have, uh, if you're worried for some reason about like bad HTTP proxies and things like this, or even HTTPS proxies that are, you know, using certificates to be bad, um, giving you the wrong code, then, you know, you can check in a file of these hashes in your repo. And then when someone else builds from that, you know, checkout of your repo, assuming they got the right checkout of your repo, which, you know, you have to start somewhere, but assuming they get that, then all the dependencies they download get checked against this file to make sure that they have the right, you know, hashes of those trees. Uh, and so these are all things like what I what I posted last night was really just sort of a demo. Um, and as I say this, I'm realizing that I didn't post the updated Go version command that pulls that stuff out of the binary. And I'll do that after this. 
But, um, uh, you know, it's just a demo of like, look, this is actually easy now that we have versioning. And, you know, whatever the final form will be will probably be a little bit different. But, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing like, I'm really excited about all the things we can build on top now. Cool. And so I, I'm just looking at the time here. So uh, maybe just before we get into questions, do you, we want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what we think the next steps are, you know, what do you think, what, what are the, the sort of the big challenges that are remaining? Where are maybe some of the opportunities for people to contribute to this, you know, to all of this problem and, you know, where, what, you know, what do we need to, to, to do next in this phase to sort of move this whole uh, thing forward? So I don't know who wants to go first. Russ, if you want to start. Uh, sure. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of open things that, you know, that this all raises, right? Um, I haven't posted yet, but at some point later today, I intend to post about uh, how proxies work in the system, right? So the, the Vigo source code that went out on Monday actually had support for proxies uh, in it and, you know, describe what that's like. And it'd be great to have, you know, better support for proxies, right? Companies want to be able to run a proxy of their own that maybe passes all the requests through the internet and just caches everything so that they know packages don't disappear out from under their developers. Or maybe they want one that doesn't go out to the internet. Maybe it just serves from a local set of packages that they have vetted in some way, uh, whether it's you know security bugs, legal, whatever. There's lots of reasons they might want to do this. And so like that proxy doesn't exist yet, right? It would be good to build that proxy. Um, there's all sorts of tooling on top of the, the versioning. Uh, there's like questions about the verification. How do, like what should we do for uh, checking, you know, the, the hash file that I talked about is for checking things you've already gotten once. How do you check things you're getting for the first time? Um, there's there's just like tons of sort of future work that we can do. And so that's one area. And the other area is just like help give us feedback, help us work through the open issues uh, as far as like what are the open questions that we need to get right? You know, what parts do we get wrong that we need to fix? And, you know, help us, you know, land this in, in Go 111 smoothly and then in Go 112. Cool. Sam, do you want to? Uh, next step things. Um, oh, man. <laughs> Uh, so, well, do you, I, I, do you um, want to go there, to Jess? There are a lot of possible next steps. Yeah. Why don't we go to Jess? Um, okay. We'll, uh, we'll let you collect your thoughts. I'm thinking about the things that Russ, Russ just said. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jess, please go ahead. Save me. Uh, nice. Yeah. So I guess like, uh, as far as like building everything out, like, uh, Microsoft has an open source team. That's myself, uh, Brian Kelson and Eric St. St. Martin. And so we offered to build like the proxy and like some, kind of backend server components for that. And then also Carolyn Van Slick and myself, also from Microsoft decided, uh, said we could help like with integration into the Go tool. So like there's like resources being devoted to working on this, which is nice. Um, and also it'll be nice to like actually get it into Go. Um, and then like, as far as getting big projects to convert, like that takes time just because like the symlink issue in Kubernetes and stuff like that is a bigger problem than actually vendoring itself. Um, so uh, yeah, like getting that stuff done is more like, you know, the internal politics of those projects. Great. And actually one of the most lightweight things that people can do is tag their repositories, right? Start actually using version numbers. You don't, have, if you're using, uh, you know, DEP or any of the other predecessors that I was aware of, like the Vigo prototype will read version information out of nine different configuration files from your repository. So all you have to do is start using actual like v0.1.2 tags, and and it will already be that much uh, you know more useful to, to people who want to import your code. Absolutely, yes. All right, Sam, let's pick it up with you. I mean, yeah. Uh, um, the spot we're in now, uh, at least step wise, is you know depth development continues. Uh, there are. Um, uh, there is a while, certainly, before you know Vigo's ready, um, and uh, uh, for the remainder of that time, we're keeping Dep around. Um, to the extent that there are aspects of the, the Vigo design that I am troubled by, um, there are things that we're doing. I mean, you know, we, we discussed like the, the high fidelity builds property, and then and then uh, um, uh, things in the Dep space. There are our ability to tinker with, for example, the ability to have that kind of property, even if we did not have MVS, is an interesting, useful bit of experimentation um, information to get. So, you know, there's there's things happening on that front as well. I feel like it's the, the clearest bit that I can add there. Yeah, I mean, de depth development continues unabated. Is there any, are there any like critical sort of learnings that you guys have picked up 
over the course of the development of depth that Vigo could learn from, you know mm. what I mean? That's one of the tricky bits with this. Uh, Vigo's model is sufficiently different from depth that there is not, uh, there's, I mean, there's, there's some crossover, but not a lot. Right. Okay. So I'm going to take a quick look here. Um, okay. So we were getting some questions in here. So I am, uh, first question here is from Sam Whited. Uh, he's saying, uh, does adding the major version to the import path encourage the context problem where two packages expose a third party, e.g. OAuth token, in their API, which is then a different type because each package uses a different major version. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, but it makes it should make that problem more visible because in one case you're returning, you know, one package is returning a v2 OAuth token and one package is returning a v3 OAuth token. They at least have different names now, right? Whereas the in the the scenario in the blog post, it can happen in a large program that you have the same thing, but they're both called OAuth token. And instead, you just have like, you know, OAuth.token is not the same as OAuth.token. And you stare at that and go, really? What does that even mean? And so I think having having that in the name actually clarifies that particular situation, which, which could arise earlier anyway. OK. Anybody else have anything to add there? Or we can go on to the next one. Um, so Zach Blint Blintliff says, uh, so why not allow small updates in MBS, reducing the cognitive load of package containers, allowing the change because of the implicit trust that is already there? Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure I understood, but I think he's asking why not uh, automatically do patch upgrades as opposed yes, to like, so. like not doing minor upgrades. Yes, and, I think and so. I've, I've seen a couple of people ask that, and I haven't really thought that much about it, honestly. I think that the conventions that people have in their heads are not necessarily conventions everyone else has in their heads. And so I'm I'm honestly just a little skeptical that, you know, patch upgrades are safe, but other upgrades are less safe. Like, I, I'd rather do no upgrades and just let the user be in control. I do think it's worth looking at after, you know, hearing this feedback, I do think it's interesting to, to wonder about sort of a go get minus you that doesn't do a full upgrade of everything, but does do patch upgrades of everything, um, if you ask it to, and that might be worth looking at. Okay. Another question here. Uh, I think that you're right about this uh, uh, import path thing. So maybe Peter Morgan says, is there any path forward with Vigo that doesn't include versions in import paths or is that design decision fixed and final? <laughs> I wouldn't say anything's fixed and final, but but really everything else is sitting on that one. So if, if we pull back on that one, a lot of other things get much, much, much more complicated. There are a number of independent components in Vigo, yeah, that you pull one and the rest go. Right. OK. Um, so uh, while we wait to see if there's any other questions coming in here from uh, uh, YouTube, I've got a few more here to maybe ask. So uh, one of the barriers for you know getting any new organization to adopt language is support for support teams like DevOps, release engineering, to learn new tools and stuff. Do you guys have any tips or best practices for mingling Go into a shop that maybe already has standardized on Java or something, or Python or something like that, where they're using something else and they need to mix it in? You know, is there any, any sort of you know tips or, or suggestions you'd have for an organization who wants to adopt it? Hook them slow. <laughs> I mean, Go, Go does, certainly have the benefit, right? It is easy to build and it is easy to ship binaries around and they are statically linked and it is that is not hard. It's really easy to sneak go in the back door. Just get it in there enough, get people used to it, then maybe start like writing some command line tools because it fits in really well for that, get your developers used to it, but it creeps through people's minds, it, it'll, it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're doing like internally at Microsoft or at least the Go people are trying because uh, I mean, obviously they're very C sharp heavy. Um, but once like everyone tries Go, then I think that they see automatically like it just clicks that obviously this is so much easier to build in, to deploy in, to like do anything in. Um, so yeah, just literally by being a better language, people adopt it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And um, what about, uh, are there any, what about um, in a large shop for managing updates to the Go tool chain? Obviously the, uh, the Go tool chain 
is has a pretty good um, pretty good backwards compatibility in the language APIs and stuff like that. Are there any like you know should should there be minimal version selection on updating Go Toolchain? <laughs> like, or is it safe to just always le leap on the latest one? I, I think I mean we've done a lot of updates inside Google. Um, we might have you know at least one of the substantial bodies of Go code, right? And um, there's two things that have helped us a lot. One is that inside Google, you have to write tests, and and you know if you have a test for something and we break it, then like we don't deploy until we fixed your test, right? We run all the tests before we, we put it in. But if your test passes and we deploy something and that breaks your production job, then like that's not our fault. The the contract is if it was important to you, you wrote a test for it, and so. Um, you know, certainly we'll work with you, right, and try to find out. But but the the contract is, we can push it out because all the tests pass. And so there's, you know, the main thing is just run the tests, like have tests you trust and run them. And you know, so when the update comes out, make it easy to try a new release and run the tests and see what breaks. And it's especially great if you can do that early, right, when the betas and the release candidates, um, especially the betas. So that you know, we get those bugs earlier and we have more time to fix them. Inside Google, we have it down to, it, it took us a long time to get to this point, but we have it down to the point where once a week we bring in the current development branch and, and run all the tests and then that feeds back into public bugs. And that, that's been really, really great for running, making the releases run smoothly. Cool. Uh, just another question that came through here. So Nathan Youngman asks, how do security updates fit into the minimum versioning scheme? I think I know the answer, but I'll let you take, take the take that one. I, I think that if security update means patch update to the extent that those overlap, I think this sort of idea of up, do, do all the patch updates, but not the others is maybe one way to deal with that. Um, right. Or obviously, I mean, you can man, you can manually update if you if you're alerted to a CVE. Oh, there, there is one other thing around security that's really interesting that this is another one of those. Now we have versioning, we can do cool things. Um, inside Google, we actually we have versioning because we just have a incrementing CL number. But um, we have all our binaries in production watch a file that they can all see updates to efficiently that lists all the known bugs in you know, old CLs. And it says like from this CL to this CL range, this bug existed and it had this, you know, if, if this symbol is in your binary, you have the bug, here's the description, here's a link to the bug tracking database. And so you can actually go to any running server and go to their st security stat or bug status page and it'll just show you the list of like known bugs in this binary, <laughs> right? Um, as of like right now. And, and you can go and then link off to them. And so we could build something like that uh, or in, in a command line tool or in other things to try to you know, query a database of sort of known problems. And I would love to see that happen once you know, the versioning story is settled. Cool. Uh, so there's a question from, uh, from Florin uh, for uh, Russ and Sam kind of thing about what the communication was like between the DEP team and, uh, and Russ there at Google with regards to Vigo and its announcement, I know that you guys said that you've been meeting here for a while kind of thing. So maybe if you guys just want to chat a little bit about what the communicate communication was like between that about, uh, you know, about the announcement and how that integration. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. So, so yeah, I mean, I've been talking to the, the package management committee off and on for the last year, mostly off, but you know, every, every couple of months. And, um, and then, like I said, in November, I, I, <clears throat> I brought up this idea of putting the major version of the import paths and, and that, um, you know, was, was met with a fair amount of resistance. Um, and so that was the point where I got, I got sort of really involved with talking to Sam frequently. And so we, we talk about two hours a week um, and, and, you know, he helped me get rid of some of my bad ideas. I'm sure there's still some of them left. It's not Sam's fault. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that that's basically it. Like we've been we've been talking about two hours a week for the last couple of months about this, and that's exactly the you know sort of amount of time I've been sort of actively working on this particular prototype. What are, Sam? Do you have any comments? I mean, uh, uh, I that is that is an accurate representation of the timeline. Um, I have a, a broader set of feels about about the the communication here that I'm not really ready to talk publicly about yet. Okay. Fair enough. What about um, so we're we're almost wrapped here. Maybe just quickly uh, to if we go around and maybe somebody you guys can talk a little bit about your current favorite open source project that is out there in the world. Just for you know, just for fun, you know, what what's one that's caught your eye that you're like, this is like really really cool. Who 
Who wants uh, to start? I go can ahead. go. Yep. Um, yeah, so like one of my favorite projects currently has nothing to do with any of this, um, but it's a uh, Go package that for Kubernetes does your networking, but it uses like BPF, which is Berkeley packet filters um, in the kernel to do it. And it's like really fast. They also have this like in kernel proxy, which is dope. It's called Cilium. Um, but yeah, I just think that they're like doing really cool innovation on Linux with regards to networking for containers. Cool. I was super excited uh, when Google announced Grafeus. Is that how you pronounce it? Grafeus? I don't know. I still have not actually tried to use it, but like given how much I care about the, this provenance and metadata question where where data and, uh, um, uh, and the software that we build comes from, uh, it's a very interesting tool for managing all of that, managing the workflow, shipping things to production, understanding what you have instead of just having things. Uh, so yeah. Again, haven't run it. Seems great. <laughs> All right. Is that like the CNCF um, story? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, my head is in a different space. I don't actually get to use much other open source software. Mostly I'm working on Go. But there are two things that I've been using a lot the last couple of weeks that I'll give a shout out to. One of them is um, Russ Ross's Black Friday Markdown Parser, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, I've been using V2, and it, it's been really great. Like All these blog posts are in Markdown, and I, I read them with a Go program and spit out HTML on one side. And on the other side, I spit out TROF that generates the PDFs. And for that, I use Heirloom TROF, which is just clearly a labor of love for the maintainer of Heirloom TROF. He has put open type and all these things into this program from 1970s. And, and it's just, it works beautifully. If you like TROF, it works beautifully. <laughs> and so like, I'm really happy with those this week. Cool. Well, I want to, we're, we're at 356 here and uh, it, we've got a little bit of wrap up. So I want to thank every all of you guys for participating and chatting today. It was a really, really cool uh, discussion here. And um, so let me just, I'm just going to get my thing shared here. Get this round table. So can you see my presentation here? Can yep. you see my slide? You see so your whole screen. You can see my whole screen. There you go. There you go. So uh, yeah, this is this is a, a URL we want you to go to. I want to thank everybody for coming, um, and uh, we want you to give your input on uh, what we want to tackle next. So, uh, you know, at Active State, we've been doing this for like twenty years, trying to in open source, and uh, you know, trying to help solve uh, organizations' problems uh, like this. This is a this is a big one that's been on our radar. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, this has been sort of useful to get everybody to hear together. Uh, so if you head to this uh, URL afterwards, you can uh, give us your feedback on what you think we should uh, tackle next uh, in, in this uh, series of roundtables, because we'll do, we'll do another one kind of thing. And uh, the, um, probably pretty soon, uh, we'll... Uh, do one in the next quarter kind of thing. And uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming again. And uh, to our panelists, so Sam Boyer from Stripe, Ross Cox from Google, Jess Frizzell from Microsoft. And uh, yeah, head on over to that URL, which is activestate.com slash go faster. And uh, you know, we'll hopefully be able to uh, solve this. So I hope you've been useful. You'll be able to find this on YouTube on our channel if you want to watch it after the fact. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much a wrap here. So thanks everybody for coming over today. Thanks very much, it was Thank fun. You. Yeah, it was fun. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>